Well, hello everyone. I'm Jill Bloom, group publisher of Roofing Contractor, Walls and Ceilings and Building Enclosure. And thank you for joining us, whether it's on video or on our podcast show. I'm very excited today to be with the Honorable Reed Ribble and CEO of NRCA. We've got lots of questions to ask you today, Reed. It's a big year and I'm with Art Eisner, the editor of Roofing Contractor. So Reed, thank you so much for joining us. Jill, Art, it's always great to be with you. So thanks for having me this morning. You bet. Thanks, Jill. Uh, and Reed, uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, it is indeed a big year. Uh, let's start by assessing how would you describe where the roofing industry is at as we uh, launch 2022 here? Well, you know, the, the roofing industry is a really big industry. Um, it, spans a, it spans a lot of things from raw material supply, manufacturing, distribution, construction, and design. I think depending where what chair you're sitting on in there, right. uh, and also where you are in the country, um, that answer might vary. And so, uh, but I think for the most part, uh, we got through 2021, which is a very challenging year. Uh, it was particularly challenging for contractors because they're at the end of the, su the supply chain. Things were were difficult to uh, to get. Materials were difficult to get. Prices were were volatile. So it's a, it's a tough deal. And I, I actually think that it was difficult for everybody because um, even though maybe as a manufacturer, you were able to pass on some of those uh, increases, um, the problem is you had disgruntled customers and who wants that? And if you're a roofing contractor uh, and you couldn't get one or two components, you had disgruntled customers and who wants that? And so, I mean, it, it was a tough year all throughout. It, it didn't matter where you were in the supply chain. Even though everybody was busy, uh, people had work and the backlog of work was strong. And most people reported having fairly good years. But um, I, I think for a lot of contractors in particular, 2021 was really challenging. And so they're optimistic, hopeful, um, and wanting to have a better 2022. We're a little bit more uh, used to, or we've become accustomed to the volatil volatility in pricing and supply. And so I, I think that the table is set for, for a better year, as long as a recession doesn't come in. And uh, generally speaking, uh, all the politicians in Washington, DC, the incentives are against a recession because they don't want to have a recession in an election year. It's rare to have a recession in an election year. So it, it, it could be a fairly good year, um, but uh, I, I do see some real strong headwinds in the future here. Now, before the end of 2021, you did formally announce uh, your retirement after five years leading the NRCA. Uh, tell us why now feels like the right time to walk away. Oh, well, I think there's a couple of things. I, uh, and this is stuff that uh, uh, heretofore was not, that people were not necessarily privy to, but I was hired basically as an interim CEO with some very specific tasks that uh, that my my uh, bosses wanted to have happen at NRCA, uh, for example, they wanted to have a professional certification program developed, designed, and launched. Um, they wanted the association to be in a better financial position. They wanted us to uh, up our game uh, on in the education space and in our work in Washington D.C. And so there were some specific things that they wanted done. At the time when I was hired, I was 62 years old. So I thought, okay, if I go for five years, I'm 61, I go for five years, I'll be 66 and I'll be about ready to retire. So uh, it was a five and a half year contract. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of at the, at, the, at the back end of that work. Those things that they asked me to do uh, are all done. And uh, it's time for a, a, a new leader and a younger leader to come in and emerge and take the association to the next level. And I do want to talk about some of those uh, specific initiatives uh, that you helped develop along the way. But be before then, given the challenges you just mentioned about 2021, uh, coming on the heels of you know, a slowed COVID-19 recovery too, uh, you know, it may be difficult to feel uh, that you know, things are rosy in the roofing industry necessarily. Uh, now, a lot of those factors are not in your control, but uh, is it hard to feel like you're leaving the industry in a healthier position than when you arrived back at NRCA? Um, I think it's harder to feel that I, I'm leaving the industry in a healthier position, given the nature of COVID and the impact on, uh, on our economy and supply chain. 
but like you said, those are things that a national association has very little control over. We don't purchase raw materials. We don't manufacture roofing products. We don't distribute them or install them. Uh, we support the, the, the uh, millions of men and women who do those things. And so there are a lot of things that we could do from a national association level that help facilitate um, smoothing out those rough waves that, that the industry was feeling. And I think we were pretty successful at that. And so I can take a, a great deal of pride in how uh, NRCA conducted its affairs during uh, 2020 and 2021. And uh, I look forward to a very bright future. NRCA is growing. It's in a strong financial position. Uh, we're adding 10 to 12 new members every single week and have for the last several years. Um, and so I feel pretty good about, about the place the association is in. Would I like it to be better? Well, yeah, of course. I don't think the work is ever done. Got it. Uh, well, it and you mentioned pro certification. Uh, you know, at, at the time when it launched, uh, or when you talked to us about it, I think the first time in 2017, uh, you said it would be the single most transformative initiative uh, that the industry has ever undertaken. Uh, that was a lot to put behind in it in terms of budget and uh, 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 the effort you and your staff put behind it. Uh, talk about the return on that investment and uh, how, how has pro-certification really fit into what NRC is about now? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about pro-certification is that this was always a long play for NRCA and for the industry. Uh, I told our board of directors that I felt a fully developed program across all 17 or 18 roofing disciplines would take more than a decade to build out. Um, we're now eight or nine certifications into that after five years. So we're right on target and maybe even a little bit ahead of target for getting the, the uh, certifications launched and out there. We did, we did hit a bump in the road with COVID because we weren't able to do in-person testing and any certification, or at least this type of certification, which is a, a measurement of a worker's competency or skill set, uh, requires face-to-face. -face. You have to actually observe a roofing worker working and then measuring that skill level and, uh, and assigning a grade to it. And so uh, we hit some bumps in the road caused by COVID, but that didn't stop us from continuing to develop out additional certifications because we know that COVID will move from the pandemic stage to the endemic stage, probably in this year. And now we're in, better, we're in a better position than ever before. But I will also say this, there's been a lot of talk in the last year, particularly in the middle part of 2021 and end of 2021, about the great resignation, about how so many people are now leaving the workforce. And the roofing industry already was in a work, worker deficit. We had more jobs than we had workers to do those jobs. And so solving the, the, the existential threat of, of workforce is part of the role that pro certification has because young workers, millennials, they really are seeking two things when they find a new job. They're seeking to have a job that, that gives them a sense of purpose in their day-to-day -day activities. And they're seeking a job whereby they can feel as if they're recognized by their peers as a professional. Pro certification does both of these things. And um, it, it, the purpose behind roofing is solving the problems of virtually every single American who lives under or works under or is educated under one of the roofs that, that a roofing worker installs, which is essential to how we live our lives here, uh, pretty much globally, but certainly in the United States. And then, so, so the purpose thing is an easy question to answer. The professional thing is much more difficult because the roofing industry has never been really viewed as a professional career. Now it is. And uh, so when I talk about transformational change, that's the type of thing that will help us get back uh, at this worker shortage, a chronic shortage that we have. Uh, that along with the NRCA's uh, career and technical education initiatives, our partnership with NCCER and others uh, to provide a trained and skilled workforce, uh, these are all starting to, uh, to, to, to gather steam and uh, we're well on the way. Yeah, one of the things that's been interesting to watch evolve from our point of view is uh, really how you've brought the industry together to speak under one voice. That, that's the name of the initiative that you, uh, that you started. Uh, talk about that and the establishment of Roofing Day and really uh, speak to the power of getting all the different facets of the roofing industry on the same message. You know, it, 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 it wasn't as big of a challenge as I thought going in, you know, um, 
uh, NRCA and I had entered into some, some um, negotiations about six months before I left Congress, and it took the whole six months to get everything kind of laid out. But uh, I really began to think about what were some of the systemic problems that I saw in the industry now that I had been removed from it during this eight years while I was uh, uh, working in the political realm. And one of the things that I so clearly remembered was how fractioned we were. It was often contractor versus manufacturer, uh, contractor versus distributor. And there was a lot of infighting going on, whether it was at, in the building codes arena or at ASTM or just relationally, the industry wasn't in a healthy spot. And when, when the industry is not in a healthy spot, they're not able to be effective in Washington, DC. So I came up with this idea about trying to get the industry to speak with one voice because I recognized as I looked at, at the industry that the bulk of our disagreements were parochial in nature. And what I mean by that is any one individual manufacturer or any one individual roofing system is parochial in that uh, if you sell thermoplastic roofing but you only sell thermoplastic roofing, that's a parochial interest. If you're a contractor and you install roofing, that's a parochial interest. And so each of those those parochial interests uh, have a place in our system. And we needed to allow those companies and organizations to retain and hold on to those parochial interests without having a fight over them. In the meantime, we could identify the 95% of all the things that we had in common. It was the 5% that kept getting us sideways with each other uh, that, that prevented us from working more collaboratively. So I basically uh, went on a bit of a tear to try to get the industry to, to identify the 95% and focus on the 95% rather than the 5% and then extending grace uh, when the 5% showed up. And, and by doing that, uh, what we have is an industry that's, that's more unified than ever in my entire 35 years, um, in part because we're no longer at each other's throats about the 5%. Instead, we're locking arms on the 95%, which is way more effective, and it's way more effective in Washington, D.C., and that's why we've been able to put some wins on the board there when we were never able to before. Uh, so we've talked about a few specific examples. I think also you know, you've spent a lot of time talking about or really trying to you know, negate the negative perception uh, of the industry that's out there. Can you talk about this perception versus reality uh, and the sense of industry pride you really wanted to uh, uh, to instill when you became uh, CEO? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, let, let, let's face it. Uh, there's a lot of people that work in the roofing industry that, that really don't want to tell their neighbors what they do. When they're in, or the, when they're together at church or at, at a picnic or at a at, a, at their kids' soccer or basketball game. You know, um, we have a tendency to look down on ourselves. And when I first came, it was really evident. And there were a lot of examples of it. And we could, we could spend the whole time of this interview talking just on this one topic. But there were a lot of examples uh, of that. And, and so I began to try to tell the industry that we're never going to be able to get anybody outside of the industry to respect what we do until we respect what we do. And it was really beginning to try to change the mindset because once you have self-respect, there's nothing that can, can pull that away. There's nothing that can take that away. And, and I often would say in audiences, you know, I, I know exactly what you do on weekends when you're driving around or you're going to church on a Sunday, you're pointing out every single roofing job that you did to your spouse and your kids. Why? Because you actually are proud of what you do and you want them to be proud of you. And um, I want you to take that pride and, and actually live that out. Because once you live that out, it becomes attractive and people want to be around it. People, want, people are drawn to the fact that you're a craftsman, that you're a professional, that you take pride in, in doing those very difficult things. And, and the, the more people could embrace that, the more society will embrace it because we have a sociological problem in America where we've taken, listen, we've always been this way a bit, but we've always talked down to people that work with their hands. And that's always bothered me that, that working with your hands was something that was less than somebody who worked necessarily with their mind or who sat and wrote or sat and uh, was a lawyer or doctor or whatever. I never really understood that. And yet every doctor and lawyer 
went to a school that was roofed by a professional roofer and they were, they were kept in the dry because of the skills of that worker. And uh, we needed to shift how we talk about ourselves first and then the, the rest of the world will talk about us differently as well. And so that was a big part of the messaging that I had. Um, and I continue to try to drive that point home. Do you think that will be your lasting legacy uh, at NRCA? And are you okay with that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I don't, um, because I don't think there ever is a lasting legacy. I think virtually everything we do in our lives is cast in sand. Um, and, and that's how it ought to be. As time changes and, and people adapt to new ideas and things, it's, uh, those things have a tendency to melt away like morning dew. And you, 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 they, they go away, they rightly should go away as, as new leaders emerge and whatever legacy they're building can begin to take shape and take form. And so legacy building has never been something I've been particularly interested in until and except with my own children. Uh, if there's going to be a legacy in my life, it must be shown out in them or in my grandchildren, not so much in my work. I also wanted to ask you about the importance of being able to share your stories. Uh, I imagine as a roofer for 30 years, that wasn't top of mind. Uh, how, did, how did that develop and what's, uh, what's the importance so we can share that with some other roofers? Because yeah, you, you know, want to keep telling those stories. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, I think uh, and you just used the word story a couple of times, a couple of times. I, I think storytelling is, is the really one of the most effective means of communication out there because storytelling becomes immediately relatable. I mean, even if you look into the Bible, Jesus taught in parables, which are stories. He used stories to make a point. And whether those stories were, were true in the sense that they actually happened or whether they were just an allegory for something that, some lesson that he was trying to portray, um, I, I think storytelling is at the heart of good public speaking, that you have to be able to, to weave a story that people will find engaging and interesting Otherwise, it becomes an intellectual exercise. And so as far as, you know, speeches that I've given that I felt that were particularly impactful, you know, it's really difficult to say because um, when I came to, to NRCA and all through my entire five years, um, I've been asked to speak at hundreds and hundreds of events. And I've unfortunately, I've had to turn down more events than I was able to speak at. But the messaging was similar throughout the entire five years as I was trying to weave a new direction for the roofing industry and a different way of thinking about ourselves and each other and about what we do. And so the, the, there, were, there were those common themes about taking pride in what you do, becoming the best you can be, recognizing that people don't leave companies, they leave bosses. So how can you be a better boss to the employers, employees that you draw? We spend all this money trying to recruit people into the industry and then we chase them away. And, and so I spent a lot of time talking about those mistakes. And um, and I, I tried to give pointers and, and things that I've learned along the way to uh, help people understand that, that hiring is a bit of an art, and, um, but being a good person is a, is, a, is a decision. Well, Reed, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Art, do you have any other questions for Reed before we close? Well, yeah, on? just uh, one more, Reed. Uh, uh, you may mention it a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, if there were one or two things that uh, you wish you'd been able to put a little more attention to during your tenure, what would they be? And then uh, if you can please, uh, you know, talk about the next guy up for the challenge, uh, what makes uh, McKay Daniels uh, prepared for uh, your successor at NRCA? Uh, that second question is way easier than the first one. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, I am so busy that it's difficult for me to, to stop and say, what should I have spent more time on? Or what do I wish I could have spent more time on? And I would say that probably if there's one thing that I felt and that when I leave NRCA will be nagging me uh, was that I did not and was not able to have enough time uh, with the, the 60 people that work for NRCA, that the interactions and face-to-face -face time with the men and women who work at NRCA that get up every single day uh, and work on behalf of the industry I, I'm, I'm intensely proud of their work. And it just never feels like I've been able to let them know that in a way that is truly meaningful and that will settle into their mind and heart. And I wish I had more time, but I've been working remotely the bulk of the time I've been at NRCA because in part, my job was to be out in the public. And so um, driving some of those big initiatives matter. 
but at the end at the end of it all um if there's a regret there it's with the fact that i didn't have enough time to spend with the team in chicago and dc in the manner that i would normally have liked to uh, as ceo but i i was a bit cognizant of that and one of the reasons i hired mckay daniels as our chief operations officer is because i knew that the staff was lacking that leadership feedback from me so I needed to put somebody in the office who would be in the office and uh, could help manage that and uh, navigate HR issues when they came up and, and some of the, uh, the, the, the problems that you have just in, in governance inside the company. And so uh, two and a half years ago or so, uh, I was able to, uh, after a lot of cajoling and interviewing and persuading, get McKay Daniels to come and join me at NRCA. Um, Within about a year, it was really clear to me that uh, he would make a very dynamic CEO. Uh, he is a highly, highly skilled manager. Uh, but not only that, he's as good or better at communication than I am. And so to, to pass the baton to someone as capable as McKay, uh, I can walk out the door and literally, and this is not any sense of false humility, I guarantee you. Um, I will be able to walk out the door and nobody will notice it because of how strong a, a leader that McKay is. And, and we've set up a transition plan that is, that is done in such a way that that's exactly how it should happen. And I think will happen. Well, I have a hard time leaving. Uh, I, at least no one will, will recognize your absence read, but uh, you, I you, you won't have a hard thing. time believing it 30 days after I'm gone. You just wait and see. I've worked, I've worked with McKay Daniels for 10 years. I probably know him as well as anybody in the industry. Um, uh, he, he's, he's profoundly capable. And he's, he's as honest a, a man as you can find. He's honest to the core. And so um, I'm, I'm really proud of my dear friend. Well, there is no doubt, Reed, that we are, we know Reed, uh, McKay is extremely capable and he is, like you said, an amazing individual. However, we will, we will be missing you. Well, hopefully we'll get to see each other at some point down the road. Right. <laughs> Most definitely. Anything else, Art? No, Reed, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. I've always appreciated the access, your candor. Uh, and really, uh, all you've done for the industry, it's really been uh, an eye-opening uh, experience for me, uh, you know, to cover, cover it. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm grateful. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's good to have such good friends. So it's always a pleasure to be with you guys. The ultimate unifier. There is no doubt about it. <laughs> you know, you try hard. Dude. Life, life's too short to be at each other's throats. I don't get that approach at all. I, I just don't understand it. I, I totally agree. Well, Reed... Yeah. Again, thank you so much, the Honorable Reed Ribble and the CEO of NRCA. It's an honor to, to spend some time with you. If anybody has any questions or they, if they need to join NRCA, please make sure you go to nrca.net. Get involved. It is one of the best things you can do for the industry, not only for yourself, but also for the industry. And if you have any questions for us, please come to roofingcontractor.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free e-newsletter, our website, or check out our new e-magazine. But most importantly, stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>